Jeff Mannion in his book, Satisfied, tells us about uh, Matt and Alicia. They survey their backyard. Where's the best place to put their swing set? Alicia is expecting in three months with their first child. And they're so grateful to God for their new little house. Uh, the last four years, they've been cramped in an apartment, but they finally amassed enough money that they can afford a down payment. They found this bargain uh, in this quaint little neighborhood, two bedroom. And they are just so happy to God for their new, new place. They make the 12 yard walk to their detached garage to get in their older but reliable car. They're thankful to God there have been no automotive repairs in the past year, which makes them feel all the more grateful. They make the 15-minute drive to visit some friends they graduated from college with. They haven't seen them since. GPS leads them to a newer neighborhood in a cul-de-sac and to their friend's carefully manicured lawn. As they get out of the car, the door to the garage is partly open. They can see two newer models. They knock on the front door and after greetings and hugs, it leads, segues into a quick tour. There's this huge entryway, it leads into the living room that's beautifully decorated and that's wide open into the kitchen. Stainless steel appliances and granite countertops and Alicia says, wow, this kitchen is beautiful. And Matt's thinking, how do they get money for all this stuff? They go upstairs to the master bedroom and two large walk-in closets. They settle down for a nice dinner. It's a warm evening and uh, on the cobblestone patio when the patio furniture does not look like it was purchased at a garage sale. After dinner, they crawl in their car for the ride home, and it's a bit subdued. Gone is the feeling of gratefulness to God and satisfaction. Instead, they're feeling poor. They feel like maybe God ripped them off. I mean, what happened? In the course of three hours, they went from being so satisfied, so thankful to God, feeling so good about their, their life, and to feeling God had scammed them. What happened, in a word, was comparison. Comparison will steal your joy. It will destroy your sense of satisfaction. <clears throat> Let's think about it another way. I need a couple volunteers. All right, Jack. Paige. All right. So I've got some chocolate ice cream here. Do you like? All right. So you want some? Yes, please. All right. So Jack, here we go. All right. You want some? Yes, please. You guys are so polite. I have to stick my finger in yours to get it out. <laughs> All right, there you go. Uh, maybe one more. There we go. Okay. There you go, Paige. Why does she get so much more than me? What are you mad about? She's got way more than I do. Well, you were happy when I gave you your ice cream, weren't you? You were pretty satisfied. She has three times the scoops I do. <laughs> I like her better. That's the deal. 
All right, so you're happy enough when I gave you your ice cream. It's only when you noticed her bowl had more that you begin to, you know, complaints started welling up, right? Well, this is the way it is with all of life. As long as we keep focused on our bowl, we can feel pretty good about what we have and how we're doing. It's when we start looking at what's in somebody else's bowl that we begin to get uh, dissatisfied. All right. Thanks, guys. You can take it with you or you can leave it, whatever you want to do. Oh, good. I can eat it. <clears throat> uh, so the problem was not that Jack was given too little. It's that Paige was given more. Uh, satisfaction is possible when we focus on our own bowl. But when we let our eyes drift to look at what in, what's in somebody else's bowl, that's when the satisfied life evaporates. Matt and Alicia pulled away from their driveway feeling grateful to God, satisfied, rich. They came back feeling like God had ripped them off. Why? Their eyes drifted from what was in their bowl to what was in somebody else's bowl. Comparison is what did it. Comparison kills satisfaction. Coveting comes from comparison, which destroys the contented life. This is the final message in our series, the original top 10. And today we come to the 10th commandment, you shall not covet. Let's read it together. Exodus 20, 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. What does it mean to covet? We don't use the word in the English language too much. I think the only place I've heard the word maybe over the last 10 years has been in a religious context. A Christian's used it and he said something like, I would covet your prayers. You ever heard that? Not so much probably because you just, who talks that way? I mean, why don't you just say, would you pray for me? When God says you shall not covet, he doesn't mean you shouldn't have desires. God has put desires in all of us. Desires to make an impact in this world. A desire to make a difference. Desire to provide for ourselves and our families. He's given men and women a desire for each other. Without that, there'd be no marriage, no procreation. Without this inner desire in each of us, there'd be no productivity, no creativity. Coveting takes our eyes off of our bowl and fixes them on someone else's bowl. It focuses our desires on what someone else has and is off limits to us. Instead of focusing on what we have, we focus on what someone else has. We can covet someone's possessions. You can covet their house. Maybe their vacation home. You can covet their car, their boat their diamond ring. You can also covet other people's uh, intangible uh, things like their intellect, their creativity, uh, their appearance, uh, their relationships, their, their wife, their husband, their kids. You can covet a sibling who has a closer relationship with mom or dad than you do, or a friend who spends more time with a, a boy that you want to date, or another kid who's preferred by the coach, or a colleague who is promoted by the boss. That can fester into a hostility, hatred toward the other person. Envy is a toxic poison that fuels bitterness, enmity, and fights. All of us can fall prey to the darkness of covetousness. Stuart Briscoe tells about he and his wife Jill visiting the Ivory Coast, country in Africa. They went to a missionary school and, 
at recess, the kids, uh, many of the kids gathered around a, a large tree and there was a hole they were looking at and seeing something beautiful. The teacher went over to see what was going on and realized it was serious and so uh, told all the kids to get away from that and called uh, three or four African workers to come and one of them climbed down in the hole and then it struck. It wrapped, it, the, the creature wrapped itself around the man's legs and then the other three pulled him out and took a machete and cut off the head of a 25 foot long python. Like those children, we can look into a hole under a tree at something that appears glamorous until it reveals its true nature. It reveals our covetousness. The Apostle Paul tells us, <clears throat> why don't you read this with me? Is the law sin? Is there words? Okay, here we go. A little louder. Is the law sin? <clears throat> Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting was if the law had not said, do not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. Paul tells us that within every one of us is covetousness. This is the sin no one wants to admit. No one wants to admit that they're envious of somebody else. The Ten Commandments make us aware of it. As we expose ourselves to this commandment, we discover how envious we can be. How prone we are to compare what we have with what others have. Envy is not good. Proverbs 14, 13 tells us, envy is rottenness to the bones. Unlike the other commandments, this is an interior commandment. It has to do with what we think about that's very secret. I can be smiling and kind toward my neighbor, yet all the while being very jealous of what they have. Uh, people can covet what you have and be very envious of you, but you don't know it because they're very, very, very kind to you and congenial. So what's the cure for coveting? Let me suggest two things. <clears throat> Watch how our Lord deals with this commandment not to covet. <clears throat> now, maybe you're not a believer. As we, saw, we sang, you know, we believe in God, we believe in Jesus Christ. Maybe you don't believe Jesus is the Son of God. But as you listen to this, my guess is you're going you're gonna to say, you know what, that's right. He's got a good point there. Uh, he's the most amazing teacher who ever walked this earth and so listen to what he says. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. You say, well, yeah, that's right. As your, as your vision dims, you go blind, your whole body's dark. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Uh, Jesus says your eye must be sound. The eye is a window. <clears throat> If your eye is unsound and you compare what you have to what somebody else has, then your whole body will be full of darkness. If you envy those who are faring better, it will darken your entire life. So here's step one of the cure. Confess your compensity to compare. I think we all do it. Let's just get it out in the open and confess it. Consider how swiftly the tide of gratitude shifts when waves of comparison roll in. Lindsay lives in an apartment with two roommates. Like other people in the entry-level job market, she has a tight budget. And she's particularly worried it's Christmas season and she, you know, she wants to buy a few gifts and yet she doesn't know if she can pay her bills. And in just getting really worried, she, she says, God, would you help me out? 
She's shocked that God answers her prayer. Two days later, the boss comes up to her and says, you know, with Christmas season, uh, there are so many people that are out of town. Would you be willing to work some overtime? She says, well, yeah. She crawls in her car after work, and her car is like filled with worship. She is so grateful to God. God, I prayed, and two days later, you answered my prayer. You gave me opportunity to work, and, and she's just feeling a gratefulness to God's financial provision. She can't wait to tell her roommates. She bounds up the porch and comes in the door, and her roommates are involved in an animated conversation. One says, my parents are going to Paris for Christmas, and they've invited me to come along. I'm so excited. I've never been to Paris in the winter. The other one says, you're so lucky. Our family goes to the same resort in Colorado year after year for Christmas. And Lindsay's sitting there, wordless. She's thinking to herself, I hate both of you. She goes to her room and sulks. She's feeling like they're going on these luxurious vacations and I am barely scraping by. She's feeling deprived. She's feeling forgotten by God. I mean, what happened? In the course of a 20-minute drive home from work, she goes from feeling, you know, focusing on her bowl and feeling answered prayer and uh, financial provision, opportunity to work, to feeling like God has ripped her off, that God doesn't care about her. Again, the culprit is comparison. She compares what's in her bowl to what's in somebody else's bowl. Comparison will always steal your joy. Coveting comes from comparison, which destroys the contented life. Step two in the cure is root out comparison by focusing on the goodness of God. In the early pages of the Bible, we meet Adam and Eve. God has placed them in the Garden of Eden, which we believe is somewhere in Iraq, you know, pretty close to Baghdad. And uh, he's given them all these trees with great fruit. They can have crispy apples, tangy oranges, uh, apricots, pomegranates, mangoes, you know, whatever. With all of that fine dining, how can the devil tempt them and turn them away from their generous creator? Simple. By getting them to focus not on what they have, but on what they don't have. My dear Eve, the devil says, have you considered the singular object God has denied you, that tree and all its beautiful fruit? Don't think about what you have. Think about what he hasn't given you. And put your desire on that. And with that, they fell. And we, their children, fall when we too compare When we covet what we do not have, we're questioning the goodness of God. When we question the goodness of God, we can brood over what our neighbor achieves. But if we believe God is good, we focus on what God has given us, not on what God has not given us. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Lamentations 3.22. Because of the Lord's great love... We are not consumed. Jeremiah is writing this and he says, we can be consumed by what we don't have. We can be consumed by loss. We've lost a loved one or something tragic that's happened in our life. Because of our Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God is good. 
Jeremiah says God's merciful. He's compassionate. He's faithful. Do you believe that? Focus on his goodness. Suppose you go to a party and there's this huge buffet of all these wonderful foods. And you get in line and the line's really long and you're way in the back and all of a sudden you notice all these people and you start to think, you know, by the time I get up there, maybe there's not going to be any food. So you step out and you cut in line and you start grabbing shrimp and, you know, these nice little cut sandwiches and cashews. <clears throat> you start grabbing, you know, stuffing them in your mouth and in your pockets. Now suppose when you enter <clears throat> the house, the host says to you, oh, I'm so glad you came. I know how you love cashews, so I've kept a half jar for you in the kitchen. And I kept a whole pie, whole pumpkin pie. I know that's your favorite. Uh, come, stop by the kitchen on your way out, and I'll give them to you. I mean, that would change your whole attitude, wouldn't it? You're, you're free to be expansive with the other guests and encourage them to try out foods because Okay. Um, you know that you're okay. There's an inexhaustible supply in the kitchen. And that's what Jesus teaches. He says, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Your Heavenly Father knows that you need these things. He'll provide for you. Seek first His kingdom. His kingdom causes and He'll give you all that you need. And so when you focus on God's goodness, you don't need to be clawing to get more. You don't have to be coveting what somebody else has in their bowl. You don't have to clutch tightly what you have. You can give generously to God. You can share generously with other people because you know God will provide for you. So why focus on what's in somebody else's bowl? Teenager, you start school. You're going to see other students that seem to have more. They seem better off. You don't need to worry about what other kids have. You focus on how good God is to you. Newly married, you know, there's always going to be people that have more. You can be all worried about what they have, but focus on how good God is to you. Single person, don't worry about what other people have. Parent, you're going to have all kinds of situations come up in your home where your son or your daughter is finding somebody has more. This is a chance for you to talk about God's goodness and help them focus on their own bowl. Empty nester, you're getting ready to retire. Of course, the question is always, when is there enough that I can do that? You always meet somebody that has more. Don't focus on somebody else. You focus on how good God is to you. Coveting comes from comparison, which destroys the contented life. The cure is to root out comparison by focusing on the goodness of God. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for this 10th commandment. On first look, do not covet sounds, we don't like it. But we see that it's just not good for us. It's bad for us to look at what in, what's in somebody else's bowl and to be comparing all the time. Help us to focus on you and what, how good you are to us and the blessings you give us and experience a satisfied, contented life. I want to give you a moment to pray. I always try to do this. I'd like you to pray for just a minute to God. Tell him what you've experienced in, in the verses we've looked at today. Maybe you start by confessing that you do covet, that we all compare what we have with what others have. 
and tell him you don't want to do that anymore and you're sorry and tell him you want to focus on his goodness and how good he is to you and what he's provided for you and experience satisfaction, contentment. If you have never committed your life to Christ, you could do that right now and just say, I, I've heard enough here that I want you in my life, Lord Jesus. You're not only a great teacher, but I believe you're the Son of God and you died for me. Would you forgive me my sins and come into my life? You can do that. I'll give you a minute to pray. Thank you, God, for your goodness to us, your goodness in creating us, giving us a beautiful world, your goodness in sending your son to die for us, to forgive our sins, your goodness in provision. And we just want to tell you thank you. Forgive us for comparing, which destroys satisfaction in you. In Jesus' name we pray.